Uh, is the interpretation function showing up for people now? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Um, thanks everybody who's here now. We'll get started in a couple minutes. Thank you. Jeff, can you hear me? This is Igor. Yes. Um, can you check your the um, interpretation button for the options? And I think that uh, right now the interpreters might be selected as panelists. I think it defaults us to panelists. I'm trying to find the options here to do that. I believe the, there's a way to access the options when you go to the actual interpretation button or the. I'm not getting the interpretation, yeah, let me stop sharing. There we go. When you go to the, your options. Okay. Uh, if you click more, I think it might be there. Are you are you able to uh just one moment? Um... Thanks everybody for being here. We are handling a couple of interpretation issues real fast. Um in the um in the panelists list, if you go to the uh sorry, participant participants, does it give you the option there to change me from panelist to Interpreter. You're showing up as a panelist right now. Mm -hmm. It shows you as an interpreter too. So yeah, I'm thinking it may, if you check the interpretation button, does it give you an option or like a section to click on for options? Manage interpreters. Mm -hmm. It says uh, your linguissimo study is there, but the other one is not. That screen, I think you also have the option to delete what's on there and then just add from the participants, add the interpreter. So. I'm sorry, we're having this. this sorry, everybody. We tested this ahead of time. Um, I might change you from the panelist to an interpreter. Uh, maybe we'll get started and um, we'll try to figure out the interpretation okay. in just a moment. Um, uh, let me start my video. Hello, everybody. My name is Jeff Abramson. I am uh, the director of the Forum on the Arms Trade. Really delighted to have you all here. I wanted to talk quickly a bit about the technology for this event and then turn it over to Leon. And hopefully I can get the interpretation working uh, in a moment. We're having a bit of technical difficulties. But once that interpretation is possible, you can go to the globe at the bottom to find interpretation in Spanish. Um, we are delighted you're here. The, we have enabled you to chat amongst yourselves but please use the Q&A function to ask questions of the panelists, and you should be able to upvote questions in the Q&A so that we know uh, which ones are most popular. The Form on the Arms Trade is a network of experts around the world who work on arms trade, security systems, and weapons use issues, and we're delighted to uh, collaborate with Leon and Asser Institute to host this event, and I'll turn it over now to Leon. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jeff, for the generous introduction and for this fantastic collaboration, as you said, between the Forum of the Arms Trade and the Osser Institute. I would also like to thank everyone who has joined this webinar as a participant and the distinguished speakers, Fadia Ibrahim,
Carlos Perez Ricard, Jonathan Lowy, and Leila Sadat for joining us. I will introduce our guest speakers very shortly. My name is Leon Castellanos Jankowitz, and I'm a senior researcher at the Osser Institute for International and European Law in The Hague and supervisor of the Law Clinic at the University of Amsterdam on Access to Justice for Gun Violence. And I will be moderating this event today. On the 22nd of January, the United States First Circuit ruled that Mexico's litigation against seven gun manufacturers and one wholesale distributor could move forward. The New York Times called this unanimous ruling, and I quote, one of the most significant setbacks for the gun industry since the passage of a U.S. federal law that provided immunity from some lawsuits to those gun manufacturers. In its lawsuit, Mexico claims that the defendant companies have aided and abetted the unlawful trafficking of an estimated half million guns into Mexico every year. To do this, says Mexico, through their irresponsible, they do this, excuse me, through their irresponsible manufacturing, marketing, and distribution practices. According to Mexico, this failure to exercise reasonable care amounts to negligent conduct that is arming drug cartels on its territory and constitutes the proximate cause of gun violence that has claimed countless lives. Today, we will hear from lawyers working with Mexico, as well as from experts and academics who will present us with an overview of the case and discuss its implications for victims of gun violence and accountability of negligent arms sales in the US and beyond. We will begin with presentations on the background and context of Mexico's lawsuit. And these presentations will be forward by a discussion of the decision in the First Circuit and the way forward in regards to further litigation. After these presentations, we will have a short reaction round where each of the speakers will be given the opportunity to build on what has already been said. Thereafter, these interventions will be followed by a Q&A session, which I will be moderating. And so please feel free, as Jeff said, to include your questions in the Q&A function on the Zoom platform so that I can address them to the speakers. Finally, before closing, we will ask all attendees to please complete a quick survey before they close the Zoom environment. This event is being recorded and it will be made available on the pages of the Forum of the Arms Trade and the Osser Institute in the coming days. Let me now turn to the first set of speakers whom I now have the pleasure to introduce. Fadia Ibrahim is Director of International Litigation at the Mexican Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Previously, she was Director for Foreign and Consular Law Litigation and Protection Officer at the Consulate General of Mexico in Chicago. She has also been Head of Department for the International Litigation Directorate at the Mexican Foreign Ministry and Legal Coordinator for Centro Mexicano Pro Bono. She holds a law degree from the Universidad Iberoamericana and a certificate from the Hague Academy of International Law. Fadia's presentation will be followed by Carlos Perez Ricard. Carlos is Professor of International Relations at the Center for Research and Teaching in Economics in Mexico City, uh, City the CIDE. Previously, he was postdoctoral fellow at the University of Oxford, where he worked at both the History Faculty and the Latin American Center in St. Anthony's College. Carlos's general research and teaching interests lie in the relationship between Mexico and the United States, security and organized crime, arms trafficking, and drug policies. He has authored and edited numerous books and research articles, and he holds a PhD in political science from the Free University of Berlin, and a degree in international relations from El Colegio de Mexico. Fadia and Carlos will discuss the background and context of Mexico's lawsuit, and will answer questions such as, why is Mexico using the US court system? What advantages and disadvantages does this have? How does this case have an impact on the security situation in Mexico and more broadly in the region? 
we will hear first from Fadia and then Carlos. Fadia, thank you very much for joining us. You have the floor. Thank you, Leon. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I also want to thank my fellow panelists and uh, everyone for being here. It is a very uh, important issue for us, for my country. Uh, we think it's a matter of the utmost importance. And that being said, I will divide my presentation in three. Uh, first, I want to address why and when did Mexico decide to take legal action against the gun industry. Then I will address why did Mexico choose to sue in the United States. And lastly, but not less important, uh, what our intention is uh, with with this whole situation and why the like what what results are we uh, expecting from the different aspects of the Mexican strategy. So for my first point, um, as you may probably all remember, back in 2019, the El Paso community suffered a shocking and, and deadly mass shooting. Although my country, Mexico, knew how easy it was to have access to a gun in the United States, the geographical and ethnic problem proximity of this incident hit close to home and served as a start as a stark reminder of how easy it is to have access to guns in the United States. Uh, I would also like to mention uh, that later that year we had the Battle of Culiacán, also known in Mexico as a Culiacanazo. It, it was an attempt for from our military to capture Ovidio Guzman, a member of a very uh, powerful cartel here in Mexico. Uh, the military succeeded in capturing Mr. Ovidio, but they, they quickly found themselves surrounded by armed groups. Uh, these groups were well equipped with firearms that are exclusively allowed uh, for the use of the armed forces. And it was a very devastating situation where civilians were involved. Uh, the streets uh, were filled with, with guns, with bullets, and uh, our armed forces and our military were forced uh, to liberate Mr. Guzman. He was later captured, but this was a very um, stressful situation. And then... Uh, in 2020, our Mexico City police chief uh, suffered an attack also by a delinquent group. Uh, he was driving in his vehicle. Uh, I believe he was on his way to work. And then uh, this delinquent group started uh, firing uh, shotguns against him and his team. Uh, we lost lives also there. Uh, the arms used in this attack were also only allowed for armed forces. Uh, although I'm just naming like three very big events, Mexico suffers uh, from gun violence almost daily. Just in 2022, 20 1,800 homicides were caused by a fire weapon. And according to the ATF, 70% of those, those firearms come from the U.S. So it was back in 2020 uh, where these events led us to establish and design a multifaceted strategy to help stop gun violence against Mexican nationals. That was actually when we met John Lowy. He's not all, only our lawyer, but one of our most appreciated and important allies in the fight for gun control. Uh, it was with the team here in the legal advisor's office, John and uh, Steve Shadowen, who is also our lawyer, uh, that we decided we needed to take legal action against the unlawful practices and negligent practices of the gun industry. Uh, I'm just going to name a few of the actions uh, Mexico has established. Uh, first, 
we filed a lawsuit against uh, weapon manufacturing and distribution companies uh, submitted before the federal district court in Boston. Uh, we actually had a very positive outcome almost a month ago uh, in the appeal court. Um, I will leave this to John. Uh, he will for, he will address this further in this in this webinar. We also filed a lawsuit against uh, gun sales outlets uh, before the federal district court in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, we had our first hearing last week. Um, we're very optimistic on the result of these uh, two uh, lawsuits. Whether the result is like uh, in favor of Mexico or not, we believe we had uh, already won a lot of points and we've uh, been able to talk about this topic, not only in the courts, but people are talking about it uh, here in Mexico. Uh, very, a lot of outlets are uh, addressing the issue and it's been, they, it's been made very clear how uh, gun trafficking to the to the from the U.S. to Mexico uh, is having like a huge impact on our security. Um, so these events um, led us to not only file lawsuits in the U.S. courts, but we also. Uh, have implemented different strategies before uh, the international um, outlets. For example, we had a hearing before the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights on Corporate Responsibility, and that opened the floor uh, for Mexico to request an advisory opinion uh, to the Inter-American Court on Human Rights on the same matter. We received a lot of support from our uh, Latin American countries, uh, not only in the request for the advisory opinion before the Inter-American Court, but we also uh, had approximately six uh, Latin American countries file or submit an amicus curiae in support of the uh, Mexico lawsuit against the gun industry. We had uh, the support of different professors, DA's officers, uh, police departments. So we really appreciate the support we're getting. Uh, I know this matter not only impacts Mexico, but it impacts also Latin America. And it involves not only the US, but also European countries, uh, so I will address this further in my in my presentation. So why did we choose to sue in the United States? Uh, this is a question that's been brought up many times uh, before. So I just want to say we respect the U.S. justice system, and we think that the best way to hold the gun industry accountable for their actions is to do it under their rules, their courts, and their language. Uh, we know we could have brought the claim in, in courts here in Mexico, but we really think the best way to address the situation is before their courts under their rules. Um, that being said, I would like to emphasize that this lawsuit is not against the United States government nor does it question the constitutional right of the U.S. citizens to bear arms granted by their Second Amendment right, nor the right of the gun industry to sell these products responsibly and in accordance with the law. Our intention with the actions being taken by uh, my country is to hold the corporation, corporations accountable for unlawful practices and to ensure the human rights of all individuals. Uh, I can attest that the U.S. 
is taking action to, pre to prevent gun trafficking by implementing more strict laws in the border, as well as regulation on gun trafficking. Uh, it was, I believe, last year or maybe two years ago that the United States regulated gun trafficking as a crime. This didn't used to be a crime, now it is. Mexico is also taking action and our authorities have seized more guns recently. Uh, 48,000 guns have been seized from 2018 to 2024, uh, increasing the seizing of firearms by 65% in this administration. Uh, it is estimated that 740,000 weapons are being trafficked to Mexico per year from the United States. Uh, according to the small arms survey in 2017, there were almost 18, 18 million illegal arms in the hands of civilians. Uh, this is not only shocking, uh, since in Mexico, we only have one store where you can acquire uh, a weapon. Uh, and it's based here in Mexico City. Also, according to the Economy and Peace Institute, the violence in Mexico has had an economic impact of $238,000 million. So I'm asking everyone, I'm asking the gun industry, I'm asking uh, the people, what is the gun industry doing to prevent illegal activities? Uh, that's the answer we're, we're seeking for, and that's where we lie our interest in. Um, I'm just checking the time I have left. I don't want to abuse uh, my fellow panelists' time. Uh, Thank you, Fadia. Fadia, could we um, come back to some of these points during the uh, reaction round? Sure, sure, sure. We Thank are you. We, we will need to move on at this point to Carlos, uh, but I really uh, think that what you have said about the context in Mexico, about the suite of actions that the government has taken in other fora, uh, both at the national and international levels, uh, has given us a very good picture of the actions that the government has taken. So now over to you, Carlos. Thank you very much for joining us. You have the floor. Thanks a lot, uh, Leon. Thank you uh, and, and Jeff for organizing this very important panel. Thanks a lot for having me today. I'm going to use my five or seven minutes to develop a rather simple argument, but one that I believe helps to contextualize the discussion we are having today. And the argument uh, goes as follows. The relaxation of federal and local gun policies in the United States in the early 2000s, symbolized by the signing of PLACA in 2005 and the termination of the Federal Assault Weapons Ban of 2004, led to an increase in the overall production of guns in the United States. And this has serious effects in Mexico as a matter of fact, a disastrous effect for Mexico. After much research, after reviewing variables extensively, and after many years of investigation, uh, there is little doubt left to point out that the crisis of homicides and violence in Mexico that began in 2007 is, and I will use very carefully these words, is strongly related to access to American weapons by criminal groups in Mexico. There is a relation between the relaxation of these local gun, uh, 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 policies in the United States and the increase of violence in Mexico. It was not the deployment of army forces. It was not increase in the price of cocaine. It was not Felipe Calderón's policy and strategy. It was not the increase in ex-convicts deported from the United States to Mexico. It was not the disaster of municipal police forces in Mexico. It was not the increased electoral alternation in Mexico after 2000 
or yes, it was all of these things together. But without access to American weapons, it is impossible to explain how Mexico experienced a 190% homicide growth between 2007 and 2010, okay? In other words, we went from having 8,000 homicides per year in 2007, 8,000 homicides per year in 2007, to having 25,000 in 2010. There is no place in the world with an increase in homicide in that magnitude, okay? As I point out, this increase in violence was anchored to the fact that the numbers of guns produced in the United States grew from 4.5 million in 2006 to 11 million in 2016. The number of guns imported into the United States also grew from an average of 1.3 million per year in 2005 to 4.2 million in 2018. Although it is impossible to have consolidated number, we just have some, some reports about this, but we don't have, in fact, the number, it's obvious that many of these weapons reached illegally Mexico. And this is where I think it gets, it gets interesting for the sake of my argument. As I have tried to explain in several academic articles and uh, with my colleague Eugenio Weigand and in a recently published book, these weapons fueled the conflict in Mexico in a disproportionate way. These weapons were the ones that enabled the diversification of the criminal market in Mexico. They are not uh, guilty. Uh, they are guilty not only uh, of homicide, but also for extortion, migrant trafficking, and other crimes. The logic of criminal networks was actually very simple and very straightforward. If we already have the weapons, why not take advantage of them and use them for other business? What I call diversification. In short, first came the weapons, the diversification, and finally the violence. All of this has a rather simple logic, as I said, but it has been difficult to understand in Mexico, and I summarize it in one simple sentence. There is no solution to the a structural problem of violence in Mexico if the problem of guns is not solved. In that sense, the Mexican government's lawsuit against the gun companies focuses precisely on the root of the problem of violence in our country. In my next intervention, I want to point out how the demand should not only be a specific action of the Mexican state against gun, against gun trafficking, it should be the guide to create a state policy against armed violence. Let me repeat it because I want to put it very clearly. It should not be just a specific action of our Secretaría de Relaciones Exteriores against gun trafficking, an isolated from the rest of the state. It has to be the guide to create a state policy against armed violence. But again, I will, I, will, I, I will speak about this in my next intervention. Let me conclude. The lawsuit should be part of a broader strategy. So far, it is just a glimmer of hope. It must be the cornerstone of the Mexican state response against criminal violence. But again, I will be, this will be part of my second intervention in, in, in the panel. Thanks so much, Leon. And I, I hope it took me less than six minutes to, to cut my argument out. Great. Thank you so much, Carlos. I think this presentation of yours uh, builds on Fadia's and really gives us an idea of the interconnected dimension of violence between the United States and Mexico when it comes to these particular weapons. And your proposal or your suggestion that the lawsuit should be part of a broader strategy in Mexico's relationship with the United States is also a very important and interesting one, particularly now that we're in a very uh, electoral year, right, in both countries. So uh, more on that soon. Looking forward to your comeback. 
for those of you who have joined us um, in the meantime, please use the Q&A function. We will have a question and answer session after the, the, uh, the panelists' presentations. So feel free to keep them coming. We will read them to our panelists later. Um, for now, let me turn to our second set of speakers, whom I now have the pleasure to introduce. We will first hear from Jonathan Lowy, and we will then have a presentation from Leila Nadia Sadat. John Lowy is co-counsel for Mexico in the case that we are discussing here today. He is founder and president of Global Action on Gun Violence and has been litigating and winning impactful lawsuits and advocating for gun violence prevention for 25 years. He has litigated in trial and appellate courts in over 40 US states and helped win over $100 million in verdicts and settlements for victims of gun violence while creating groundbreaking precedent that holds gun companies accountable for their contribution to said violence. He's published numerous articles on gun issues, including the right not to be shot and appears frequently on television and other media to raise awareness about these issues. He's a graduate of Harvard College and the University of Virginia School of Law. Right after John, we will hear from Leila Nadia Sadat, who is James Carr Professor of International Criminal Law at Washington University and fellow of the Shell Center for Human Rights at Yale Law School. Professor Sadat has served as Special Advisor on Crimes Against Humanity to the International Criminal Court Prosecutor from 2012 to 2023 and was recently appointed as U.S. expert to the OSCE Moscow Mechanism. She's one of the world's foremost authorities in the fields of public international law, international criminal law, international human rights law, and foreign affairs. She is the current chair of the International Law Association's American branch and a member of the American Law Institute, Institute and the U.S. Council on Foreign Relations. John and Layla will tell us more about the First Circuit's decision, including what is the procedural way forward? How have the defendants reacted? Is the US Supreme Court gonna get involved? And what is the prospect of the trial for potential evidence in future litigation by victims who might be emboldened to come forward? We will hear from John first and then Layla. John, thank you very much. You have the floor. Sure. Thanks so much, Alion, and uh, thanks everyone for attending. I'm going to briefly uh, discuss Mexico's lawsuit against uh, Smith and Wesson and the other gun manufacturers, and summarize the First Circuit's decision and talk a little bit about the next steps in the case. And and first to understand the case, I, I, I see that there's a lot of people from outside of the U.S., a lot of people who are not attorneys. Um, it's important to understand the basic principles that uh, Mexico is asserting in the case. And the fundamental claim, there are a few, is uh, negligence. That is the allegation that uh, the gun manufacturers are not using reasonable care in their sale and distribution and marketing of firearms, and that is causing injury uh, to Mexico, as, as the other speakers have noted. And uh, that's generally a, a pretty simple concept. Uh, in U.S. courts, negligence applies to all activities and all people. Um, you can be found uh, negligent if you don't use reasonable care in uh, the sale of BB guns or uh, tuna fish sandwiches, uh, or if you're texting while driving and um, uh, injure somebody. Um, th where things get complicated is that in 2005, Congress enacted at the gun industry's behest uh, a law called PLACA, the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act, uh, which in some ways changed legal accountability for the gun industry. And some courts have held, I think incorrectly, 
that PLACA prevents gun manufacturers and other gun companies from being held liable for negligence, at least uh, unless they also violate some uh, statutory law or fall under uh, some other exception to uh, PLACA. And just to step back and think about the you know, how extraordinary a notion uh, that is. I mean, the argument is uh, that if you negligently sold a, a BB gun or, as they say, a tuna fish sandwich that uh, spoiled, um, you could be liable for resulting injuries. Uh, but the argument is if you negligently sold an AR-15 uh, that supplied a ruthless gang member uh, you would not have civil liability uh, because of this law. Again, I think those interpretations of the law are incorrect, but that's essential. So uh, brought this case, I invite people to read the complaint. It's on uh, our website, actiononguns.org. Um, and it goes into great detail explaining uh, why Mexico believes that manufacturers are liable under basic principles of U.S. civil justice. Uh, the defendants then moved to dismiss the case for reasons, but mostly uh, arguing that it was prohibited under this federal law, PLACA. And the trial court accepted uh, those arguments and dismissed the case, holding that it was prohibited by PLACA. Uh, Mexico then appealed to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the First Circuit, and that's a decision we're discussing here. That court uh, unanimously held that PLACA did not bar the case and uh, sent the case back down to the trial court. Let me just very briefly summarize the court's ruling. Uh, the essence of the court's decision was that Mexico's claim come under uh, what's called the predicate exception of PLACA. And that essentially says, and it's part of the, the PLACA statute, that, and I'm paraphrasing here, but it's basically uh, accurate. It says that if a gun company knowingly violates a applicable law, which certainly includes firearms laws, and that violation approximately causes injury that they are not specially protected under PLACA. They lose that special protection and therefore they can be subject to civil liability like everyone else in society. And the court, uh, the First Circuit, held that Mexico had adequately alleged violations of law. Uh, that is, that defendant's conduct was not simply negligent, not simply failure to use reasonable care, but also, uh, if proven, uh, was unlawful, um, and that it was, in various ways, aiding and abetting uh, gun trafficking, uh, illegal gun sales, uh, and other crimes. So that, that was uh, the essence of the decision. Um, and so now the case is goes back to the trial court for some other uh, rulings on personal jurisdiction, other matters that uh, the trial court did not rule on before. And uh, the defendants, the gun manufacturers, have stated uh, publicly and now in filings that they are seeking review before the U.S. Supreme Court. So that will be the next stage. Extremely important point here, though, is that uh, the defendants nor anyone else is entitled to review before the U.S. Supreme Court. And uh, the, the Supreme Court takes an extremely small percentage of the cases that where people are asking for review. Um, I think it's about 2% or so uh, of the the cases where review is sought um, are actually taken by the court. Um, and we'll see what the court uh, chooses to do. Uh, I believe uh, it is extremely likely the court will not take uh, this case. 
and that basically the, the metrics, the criteria that the court uses to select you know, this very small group of cases just simply don't apply to uh, Mexico's case for a whole bunch of reasons. But you know, we'll see what the court does. If the court takes the case, um, then we'll go through that, that process, ultimately briefing and ultimately argument, which will take uh, a number of months. Um, I also think that if the court takes the case, and we'll have to see, I'm, I'm confident that the, uh, the court would uh, agree with the First Circuit. Um, so if the court does not take the case, we will get back to the trial court sooner. We will deal with these other issues that I mentioned and then go into uh, discovery, um, which is where uh, Mexico is entitled to ask for and receive documents and other evidence from the defendants and others. Uh, their depositions, which if you've seen on, on YouTube or on TV, which where you're questioning uh, executives of the uh, companies under oath, um, I've, which I've done in, in, in other cases, as have other lawyers. And uh, suffice it to say, uh, that will be uh, very interesting and educational uh, as to the evidence and the defenses that are made by the uh, manufacturers. And then the next stage is would be, uh, we can go into, I see time is, uh, I'm finished with my, uh, a lot of time, but ultimately trial. Um, uh, so hopefully that was helpful. I'm happy to answer uh, questions and look forward to the rest of this discussion. Great. Fantastic, John. Thank you so much for this informative rundown of the case and its status right now. Uh, without further ado, I would like to hand over now to Professor Sadat. Leila, you have the floor. I'm muted and now my video is on. <laughs> okay, still haven't yeah. learned to do that. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. And honestly, I could listen to my co-panelists all day because I think that the um, practical information and, and sort of the description of what's actually happening in Mexico is critically important to understanding why the work of Jonathan Lowy and now Global Action on Gun Violence is so important. A little bit about how I came to this issue. Um, I, I am a human rights lawyer and most of my work actually is in the field of atrocity crimes, war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. But I've also been working in the human rights field. And one of the things that is shocking is in the United States, which is how I came to this, not through uh, Mexico, we suffer more than 40,000 gun deaths per year. And these are so extreme that looking at this from an international law perspective, uh, in my view, they violate a whole series of treaty obligations and customary international law obligations that the United States is required to comply with. Now, bringing cases involving treaties or custom in United States courts is very, very difficult. And so one of the things that uh, a human rights lawyer does faced with the kind of obstacles to enforcement in domestic courts is we go to the international system. And so the first place that I went to was the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, where we testified twice on the scourge of gun violence in the United States. We hosted a conference on this. Um, we went to the Human Rights Committee and the Human Rights Council and are now, uh, I'm looking at the Committee Against Torture, um, arguing that school shootings in the United States amount to cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment, violating the Torture Convention. I met through this work, the amazing Jonathan Lowy, um, and he then started looking at this from uh, the outside in, in a way, uh, looking at the scourge of gun violence, particularly in the Americas and particularly in Mexico, our closest neighbor and dearest ally. And uh, I apologize on behalf of the United States for the scourge that gun violence has inflicted on Mexico. Um, 
Ironically, one of the biggest political issues in the upcoming elections in the United States is immigration, but very few make the connection between the flood of guns streaming south and the flood of people coming north in order to escape gang violence and gun violence in the Americas, largely fueled by the illegal presence of U.S.-made weapons. Um, so let's turn to this lawsuit, and then I can talk in the Q&A a little bit more about what else can we do in, in the international sphere to address this. This lawsuit, I think, is a brilliant example of strategic impact litigation. Um, it was, I think, one in a way on the facts. The complaint, which you can see on Jonathan's website, is 139 pages long. And even the district judge, who was a Republican appointee, um, and clearly the three members of the First Circuit, read those facts and were convinced at the legitimacy and of the complaint by Mexico uh, and the uh, impact that U.S. gun manufacturers were inflicting, not just through negligent um, allowing uh, guns to be trafficked across the border, but in fact, marketing their products specifically for the Mexican market, um, using military style language, suggesting that these weapons would in fact be able to arm individuals as if they were a military, putting designs on the weapons themselves that were designed to appeal to the Mexican market, and turning a blind eye to the 12 dealers who they knew were likely engaging in the kind of trafficking that was allowing these weapons to go south. And if you do just a little bit of research about this, you'll find that at least 50% of the company's sales are dependent on these illegal weapon sales south, meaning that the U.S. companies we're talking about aren't going to survive in business very easily without this flood of weapons going to our neighbors. So the lawsuit itself, I think, very brilliantly uh, focuses on this. The initial phase of the lawsuit was of great interest to international lawyers because Mexico was arguing something a little bit more creative than uh, we now have, which is this transnational tort. And Mexico actually argued that Mexican law, not U.S. law, should apply, which would have completely divested, uh, it would have sort of kicked placa uh, out in a way. And I think uh, Jonathan and his colleagues made a run at that again when they filed their appeal. The First Circuit, and this goes to some of the questions in the chat, maybe the First Circuit, I wasn't there for the oral argument, Jonathan, maybe you can talk about it. Maybe the First Circuit judges liked those arguments, um, but I think they knew that accepting them could spark the interest of the Supreme Court. And so I think they went for a fairly conservative reading of PLACA. They decided it actually applied, but that the predicate exception, which is one of the exceptions, was also fulfilled, which is why the Mexico can lawsuit can sort of clear the PLACA hurdle. They didn't find that PLACA didn't apply at all. I think they could have found that, but I think had they done so on one of the theories that had been put forth by the plaintiffs, that could have attracted uh, the attention of a Supreme Court that just seems absolutely intent on broadening access to weaponry in the United States uh, to the greatest degree possible. Um, again, thinking about some of the questions in the chat, the U.S. Supreme Court right now is hearing a bump stock case. Um, they seem completely confused about how weapons are are used uh, to, to create crimes. I was watching a little bit of that argument. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court, in my view, should probably get out of the gun business entirely. But unfortunately, at least one or two members of the court are really intent on uh, expanding Second Amendment rights. Whether that will attract them to this particular litigation, I have no idea. Uh, they recently heard the Rahimi case, and Jonathan um, was kind enough to invite me to contribute a small human rights section 
to that case. And I think that case might be a case that we actually win. So to the question in the chat, do we ever win these cases? I think Jonathan has shown that there are winnable cases. And in my view, they're largely being won on the facts. Uh, the law can be pushed in many, many different directions. Uh, the case is the Rahimi case. I just saw that in the chat. We're expecting the opinion in June or July. And that case had particularly good facts. The individual who's, who challenged the application of a federal law that allowed police to confiscate his gun because he was a known abuser uh, and known to be violent. They had followed all the procedures in so doing. And, and he was really a pretty dangerous individual. And so even the United States Supreme Court in oral argument, you could see was was sort of listening because even the justices can feel threatened by dangerous individuals. So I think in Rahimi, we might get a win and we might see a little bit of retraction away from the Bruin case, which was this very expansive case where the court basically said we had to look to um, the founding. And if guns weren't prohibited, if, you know, if access to weapons wasn't prohibited by a similar law at the founding, we could throw it out in the 21st mm -hmm. century. And there was even some um, really awful argument that since domestic violence was actually sanctioned uh, at the founding, the federal law permitting the taking away of weapons from abusers was unconstitutional in the 21st century. I think even this Supreme Court thought that went a bridge too far. So I think the First Circuit, in a way, by rejecting the theories that I thought were the most promising in the case, that is, the ones that centered on the extraterritorial uh, application of PLACA on Mexico's right to apply Mexican law inside Mexico. I think the fact that the court sort of skipped those, right? It, it, it sort of didn't agree with those, but managed to allow the lawsuit to, lawsuit to survive under a much more traditional statutory interpretation ground. I agree with Jonathan. I think they'll be less likely to attract the ire of the justices on the Supreme Court that are out looking for gun cases to take. And I think it's a terrific piece of lawyering that that you know provides a, a sliver of hope uh, in these cases. I should also say the, the other thing that's happened in the United States, and this will be my last point, is I don't know if you saw the, the recent Michigan shooting where a kid basically got a gun and the parents were indicted for the shooting uh, and they were actually found to be liable. So I do think that creative lawyering finding uh, individuals who can uh, be sued or companies who can be sued are critically important. And getting at the dealers and the manufacturers is a critical part of this problem. So thank you so much for giving part of your leap day uh, to this. You got an extra 24 hours uh, this year and you spent one hour of it here. And I'm happy to take questions in the Q&A. Great, thank you so much, Layla for that overview that shows exactly how this case has international implications, not just for the bilateral relationship between Mexico and the United States, but also when you harness international human rights law, which you have closely worked on for many, many years, uh, including at the inter-American level, we see these connections. And so this case not only represents an opportunity to put these issues on the table, uh, with respect to the situation and the security of Mexicans, but also for the broader region. We see, for example, in Latin America, that a lot of these American um, weapons are trickling down. And also not just from American companies, but uh, from where I'm sitting, I look at this problem, for example, from a European perspective. And a lot of these companies uh, have headquarters in the United States, they're European companies, and they're manufacturing and making these guns on US soil because they otherwise would not be able, legally able to make them here in Europe. And so about 40% of crime guns in some regions of Latin America are manufactured by European companies in the US or come directly from Europe. So again, we see uh, that the issue is global, 
and has many more implications than the ones that Mexico is putting forward and hopefully creates the adjacent possibilities for further conversations, such as the ones that you have gestured towards all of you in each uh, and every one of your presentations. So thank you very much, Leila. Thank you very much to all of the intervenants for their opening remarks. And now let me just turn back to the initial set of speakers. We'll circle back to each of the speakers for a brief reaction round. And if they already want to address some of the questions or pick up on something that they would like to highlight. So please, Fadia, you have the floor. Uh, let's have two minutes per speaker so that we have enough time for the Q&A. Fadia, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, apparently, I'm not very good with time management, so I'm just going to address why this time our, our lawsuit is different, although I think Leila addressed the questions and this topic brilliantly. Uh, it was actually the precedence on the matter uh, that we faced as Mexico, a lot of skepticism uh, with our lawsuits. The gun industry has not lost a case up until now because the courts have always recognized their immunity. This time, the Court of Appeal recognized Mexico proved an exemption to the immunity, and that's why our case is different. And I do believe we have strong arguments, as Leila and John had already stated, uh, and I believe we are going to be seeing a very positive outcome on this both on these two litigations. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Fadia. Carlos, please go ahead. You have a couple minutes to come back to your points. That, that was quick, uh, Fadia. Uh, in my first intervention, I, I pointed out as a central argument that the growth in, in weapon production in the United States and the relaxation of controls fueled uh, the criminal conflict in Mexico. In this second uh, intervention, I, I just want to highlight the relevance of the lawsuit within the framework of a state policy against armed violence in Mexico. Uh, what would this entail? First, the need for Mexico to have uh, updated data. Currently, we don't know how many weapons are in Mexico, how many weapons circulate in Mexico. A new federal law with civilian and military balances is urgently needed. Without reliable databases, we will not be able to generate public policies in line with the problem. Second, Mexico must build a true national coordination agency on firearms similar to the ATF in the United States. It's incredible that with insecurity and, and arms trafficking being Mexico's central problem, we do not have an authority responsible for formulating and coordinating arms control policy. We just don't have it at the federal level. Mexico needs its own ATF with budget and uh, human resources. Third, the best way to prevent uh, homicidal violence is to focus on the most vulnerable groups and uh, with those who have already been injured by a shot. In the United States, there are very good violence intervention programs in hospitals and schools and so on. Similar programs are urgently needed in Mexico. Here, the, the, the key word is prevention. Fourth, Mexico must have the issue of firearms as a central topic in its relationship with the United States. That means, obviously, continuing lawsuits against gun shops and guns manufacturers but also we have to improve lobbying efforts at the state level to call for better background checks in Texas, uh, Arizona, and other states in the United States, to linking the agenda of firearms to that of drugs. If drugs are relevant, as much as drugs are relevant for the United States, arms should be as relevant for the Mexican state. And that involves, obviously, to improve border infrastructure. It's not possible for 600 firearms to enter Mexico daily with hardly any difficulty. This should be a state priority. The message the Mexican state government must send is very simple and uh, straightforward. Violence in Mexico is beyond the borders of the United States. 
but is within the control of the United States, okay? To convey this message, the role of civil society is uh, uh, vital. And uh, lastly, number five, we have to uh, have a better understanding that organized crime always stays one step ahead of public policy. Mexico and the United States uh, must create a binational group that asks for a, a, a future-oriented question. What are we going to do with 3D printers? How can we anticipate technological advances? How are we going to react against golf guns or self-made guns? Let me just conclude, Leon, uh, with three main ideas that summarize my uh, two interventions. First, the solution to the problem of violence in Mexico lies in the United States. Second, there is no public policy that can address the structural problem of firearms. No police reform is sufficient. No justice system reform can withstand the unbelievable number of weapons circulating in Mexico. And third, there will be no way to demilitarize public security without demilitarizing organized crime, and therefore it's important to, uh, 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 to have efforts in this, in this agenda. Please don't get me wrong. I'm very glad that, that both lawsuits against gun shops and manufacturers has meant a huge jump in efforts to address the gun problem in Mexico, but the Mexican state must do more, much more to solve the problem of firearms. It's time to create a state policy against firearms. And again, these lawsuits is, should be the cornerstone of it. Thanks so much, Leon, for the time. I, I hope it was not too, too long. Thank you, Carlos, for that very much. Let me now turn to John for his comeback round. Sure. Just uh, I'll be really quick. I mean, the the problem of gun trafficking from the U.S. to Mexico is a problem crisis on both sides of the border. That's my main point. Uh, you know, when uh, U.S. guns uh, facilitate and enable cartel activity, that leads to fentanyl trafficking and overdoses in U.S. communities. That wouldn't happen if you didn't have this crime gun pipeline. Cartel violence spurs migration, which is a major US political uh, issue. The cartels are uh, making a presence in US cities um, and, and communities. So, you know, people in the US should be every bit as concerned about the crime gun pipeline flowing into Mexico as people of Mexico. And my hope is that both of our communities, as well as other countries that are uh, damaged by uh, trafficked US guns, uh, can join together and to fight this common problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Layla, let me now give you the floor for a couple of minutes. Thank you. And, and I won't take too long. Um, what I think we were trying to do with our project, and the fact is that this has happened, actually, is sometimes you have to change the way people think in order to, lead, to win a lawsuit. So uh, when we first started, the entire conversation in the United States centered on the Second Amendment. That's all you could hear. And, you know, Wayne LaPierre, who's now been sanctioned by a federal court, and his mantra that the only way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. And that was the entire conversation in every newspaper on every television show. When we started our human rights and gun violence, that we have a right to life, that we have a right to security, that kids have a right to go to school, that you have a right to health, that you ought to be able to go to a theater and enjoy a concert. Um, that it just nobody was talking about that. And now, actually, in the political dialogue, everybody's talking about that. And so I think there has been a huge shift. Um, I remember when we had a conference, Philip Alper saying, you know, you have to think of the problem of gun violence in terms of the vector. The gun is to gun violence like the mosquito is to malaria. It's 
the guns and getting Americans to realize that it's the guns, just the way uh, Carlos and Fadia were talking about. It is the change in law that saw the spike in violence. And the big thing that changed really is the influx of guns and getting Americans to recognize that is going to be important because our courts are sensitive to sort of public trends and public thinking. So I'm super grateful to all of you, to our Mexican brothers and sisters who are working so hard on this, to Jonathan with his amazing litigation strategy, and to everybody else working to really change the content and the tenor of the dialogue. Because, you know, human rights begin at home. And even if we can't access them directly through our federal courts, we can make people think about them. So thank you so much, Leon, and all the others for being here and for the opportunity uh, to be present. Thank you, Leila, for that very encouraging message. Human rights do begin at home. And hopefully this lawsuit is moving the needle right towards uh, that discourse and enabling other people to come forward and using and harnessing that discourse in a positive way that involves change. Let me now uh, move to our Q&A session. If you have a question, please pop it into the Q&A function in the Zoom platform. Uh, I want to pivot with the first question towards the Mexico-US relationship. And here I will, um, and please, yes, uh, open up your cameras, uh, speakers, so that we can all engage with each other here. Uh, my first question will go to both uh, Carlos and Fadia, and it is the question that was asked by Julian Castro Rea. Um, I want to take this question uh, about the labeling of the cartels as terrorists because it opens our perspective into towards uh, the Mexico-U.S. border, where which has been a flashpoint in recent weeks uh, on both sides, right? in terms of migration and in terms of security and in the defiance of the governor of Texas vis-a-vis uh, -vis the U.S. federal government. So lots of things happening there. And the question that Julian is asking is, what is your take on the attempt of some U.S. politicians to consider drug traffickers as terrorists? What are the impacts of this attempt on the lawsuits? So um, maybe Carlos wants to take uh, the first bit, and then I'll hand it, and then Fadia, please feel free to jump in. Since, uh, since I was a, a child, I'm still very young, but, but since I was a child, this question came always around uh, pre, uh, prior to the elections. Eh? What about if we name uh, the drug traffickers and we label these drug traffickers as terrorists? Again, comes, uh, 20 years ago, it was the, exactly the same discussion. And it's obviously uh, not a, a, it's not a strategic uh, response, it's a political issue. And it's obviously related to the 224 elections and less about a real response uh, against drug trafficking from the United States. So I, I wouldn't take this very seriously. In base case scenario, it will only give some sort of uh, tools to the CAA to collaborate in drug trafficking in Mexico, but I, I don't think that uh, the White House is uh, interested uh, in that. And uh, I don't believe it will have direct consequences on the lawsuit since, it, since this lawsuit is not against uh, the, the, the state or the government, but against uh, specific manufacturers or, 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 or shops. So I, I wouldn't take that very, very seriously. It's part of the electoral uh, atmosphere, and, and we should not take that very seriously. Thank you, Carlos. Fadia? Yes, I agree with Carlos. Uh, I'm not usually one to uh, respond a question with a question, but I will do it uh, now. Uh, I would just say that if we classify uh, the cartels as terrorists, then would we then say the gun industry is helping a terrorist group with their attacks. Uh, I would just leave that uh, for a reflection. I think it's uh, a good question. Uh, and that, that would be my intake on this. Great, thank you, Fadia. Um, I have a question for John and then one for, for Leila. Uh, First question to John, uh, TP's Isaiah, John, is asking um, whether this case is a game changer. What makes the Mexico case against these gun manufacturers different 
And why do you think that the arguments are new? Well, I mean, it, it's certainly a very important decision uh, because you have a federal appeals court upholding these uh, claims against gun manufacturers. And, um, you know, there, there's just a number of, of aspects that, that make that decision uh, extremely uh, influential um, and impactful. Um, I mean, one thing that the, uh, I mean, the court, you know, took the allegations and held that those allegations uh, sufficiently allege uh, unlawful conduct and that they're not protected under PLACA. Um, and this is the, uh, and having a federal appeals court do that in particular is very impactful. Uh, there were some other Courts that had held uh, some aspects that were similar. Um, many of those were in state courts um, in in Indiana, and, um, and there was the, the the Sandy Hook case in the Supreme Court of Connecticut, and a uh, few others. Um, there have not been many in in federal court, and. Um, so I think that that makes it very impactful. The fact that this was a country um, is a country bring suit. Um, and that's the first time there's been a country bring suit against the gun industry. That is a, a huge deal. And the scope of the problem is so massive um, of the flow of guns from the U.S. to Mexico um, that, you know, if it's addressed by the court system, as, as I uh, think and hope that it will be ultimately that you know could have a huge positive effect as i've said on both sides of the border so so there's a, a lot of ways in which this case is is a big deal great <clears throat> thank you john and i'm aware that there's a couple other countries that have been following this closely and maybe we can come back to you in a bit and you can talk about who those countries uh, who they are and and whether you think that they will initiate litigation as well um but now i want to turn to leila because there's a couple of questions about um international human rights law and international humanitarian law and also icl leila from lauren mcmillan and James Onalaja. Essentially, the question is, do you see this case as having broader legal imp implications for weapons and arms companies exporting to countries or regimes that violate IHL or um, engage in systematic human rights abuses? Uh, here we can think of places like uh, the Myanmar regime, uh, of, but of course, theaters of terrible um, things that are happening in the Middle East and also uh, in Ukraine. So Leila, would you like to say something about this? Yeah, I, I think the beauty of the Mexico case is its simplicity. One gun shop in the entire country, a huge flood of weapons across the border. You can actually go find the dealers who are doing it. So replicating that for other countries in U.S. courts, I think will be very challenging. Now, that said, I do think courts globally speak to each other. One of the big cases that's all over the news right now is this Dutch case where there was an actual lawsuit brought to stop the Netherlands from sending, uh, I think it's F-35s to Israel because of the fear that they were being misused or that the actuality, it's, you know, we're not going to go there. It's a different webinar um, in, in Gaza. And so I do think that everybody looks at a lot of these cases to see what's happening. Where, and I think Jonathan will get to this, it's Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala. These are the countries, I think, looking very closely at what Mexico is doing because they're also the countries being afflicted by the trafficking across the border and driving immigration northward, north. Um, the other thing is there are international treaties on this and the United States is not party to those treaties. So getting the United States to join uh, the treaty regime that would cover uh, 
uh, small arms mm -hmm. is actually a huge, um, I think it's a political issue. That's something maybe Mexico can pressure the United States government. Um, it would presumably take se Senate ratification. So that's really quite difficult. But I think that there are global regimes that are designed to address this very problem. And it would help if some of the biggest uh, exporters were actually participating in those regimes. Great, thank you, Leila. I promised John uh, a quick comeback. Uh, and John, you're gonna have the last word because we do need to close after this. Um, we have many more questions and uh, it's been fantastic, but please go ahead, John. Well, I, I guess I would just say that uh, uh, thank you to everyone. It's really been great to be with these uh, incredible panelists and you, Leon. Um, you know, uh, I would say that that if Mexico's case succeeds, and I think it is already succeeding and already has succeeded, uh, that in itself will greatly reduce the flow of crime guns and hence gun violence, organized crime, in Mexico, in the U.S., in Jamaica, in Haiti, uh, throughout the, the, the entire region um, without any other uh, countries bringing suit because it will change practices in a very significant uh, way and also the structure of accountability of the gun industry. So, um, you know, before, you know, talking about what comes next, I think it's important to focus on this effort alone and said it uh, before, I will say it again, I believe Mexico is truly leading the world in combating gun trafficking and gun violence in its actions that really should be applauded by the entire international community. Great. Thank you, John. On that note, let me thank all of the panelists once again uh, for joining us today, for sharing their expertise, and for giving us this really 360 view of the Mexico case, but also beyond, and how international law, domestic law, uh, and different countries are leading these efforts. Thank you also to Jeff Abramson, uh, who is there somewhere in the background, uh, making sure everything works in this webinar and for the fantastic collaboration. And thank you all participants, people who ask questions, um, we will be sending a follow-up email or posting information with additional resources. So uh, please stay tuned for those. Leila mentioned some cases, John and Carlos and Fadia. So we will all pull in our uh, materials and follow up with you all. Thank you to everyone who asked the question. And please um, don't forget to fill out the short survey that we have for you right after the transmission. It's really, really quick. We would really appreciate your feedback about this event. Thank you, everybody, once again, and wishing you a great, great, great rest of your day. Thank you, Leon. Thank you. Yes, thanks so much. Thank you. Muchas gracias.